Welcome to Explore the Bible. Today we'll be looking at 2 Kings chapter 12, verses 4 through 16. In this lesson, we're going to see Joash repair the temple. We can learn a lot about leadership from this lesson. Far more important than that, we'll learn a lot about how to improve our relationship with God, and we'll see what honors God is those who honor him. <clears throat> Joash is the eighth king in the southern kingdom of Judah, which includes Jerusalem, where the temple is. The name Joash means given by the Lord. Joash was a child, seven years old when he became king, and he reigned for 40 years, one of the longest reigns of all the kings after the split of the kingdom in two. If you've been following our study, you know that the kings in green were generally good, and the kings in red were generally bad, spiritually speaking. Jehu in the north is in yellow, which means he's mixed. He's some good, some bad. Joash is in purple to highlight our current study. Like Jehu, Joash did some good things, and he did some bad things. So eventually, he'll end up in yellow as well. Joash becomes king as a child in a season of turmoil. In the north, Jehu, a captain in the army, kills both the king of the north, Joram, making him king there, and he kills Ahaziah, uh, who is king in the south. Ahaziah is the father of Joash and was only king for one year. Ahaziah's mother, Athaliah, reigns over J Judah for six years in absence of a king. She's the only woman in the Bible to have reigned as a monarch over Israel or Judah. She begins to destroy all aspects of the worship of God in, in, in Judah, and, he, and, and she promotes the worship of Baal. She is the daughter or granddaughter of Omri, the king of the northern kingdom some 30 to 40 years earlier. She sets out to destroy all of the royal family remaining in Judah, which would, if she were to succeed, would cut off the line of David. Jehos Je Jehosheba, the aunt of Joash, rescues him from certain death and hides him in the temple and raises him there with her husband, Jedidiah, who is the chief priest in the temple, and in doing so, they preserve the line of David. Joash is all that stood between the line of David continuing or being extinguished. Adaliah is ultimately killed, and Joash is presented as king at the age of seven, the youngest of all the kings of Judah, five years before the Jewish age of accountability. We know that in the Bible, the number seven represents perfection and completeness. So it is a sign to us that this is the timing uh, or is the will of God. An important verse is chapter 12, verse 2, where we are told, Joash did what was right <clears throat> excuse me, in the eyes of the Lord all his days, because Je Jehadiah, the priest, instructed him. The priest who raised him as a child continued to counsel him as a king. This is important because Joash did what was right while Jehadiah was alive, but after his death, Joash did evil. This illustrates the importance of godly counsel and accountability. Remember the parable of the sower and the soils that Jesus spoke about in Matthew chapter 13? Seeds fell on four types of soil, some along the path where the birds ate them, on rocky ground where the seed quickly sprouted uh, and just as quickly was burned up by the sun because it had no root. Um, for, uh, the seed that was amongst the thorn, which was eventually choked out, and on the good soil, producing an abundant crop. Joash is perhaps the rocky ground. He sprouted and grew up uh, as long as Jehadiah guided him, but once Jehadiah died, it became clear that Joash had no deep spiritual roots. As we look at 2 Kings chapter 12, verses 4 through 5, we see this. This is Joash said to the priest, we don't know the timing of the events that we're about to read, but they are presumably sometime after Joash became king at the age of seven. Continuing on in verses four and five, all the money of the holy things that is brought into the house of the Lord, the money for which each man is assessed, the money from the assessment of persons and the money that a man's heart prompts him to bring into the house of the Lord. Let the priest take 
each from his from his donor and let them repair the house wherever any need of repairs is discovered. The temple is over 125 years old, and the issue is that it is in need of repairs. In the parallel, in, in 2 Chronicles 24-7, we're told, for all the sons of Adaliah, that wicked woman had broken into the house of God and had used all the dedicated things of the house of the Lord for, for the Baals. Remember, Joash was hidden in the temple to save his life from Adaliah, his grandmother. He was raised and he lived in the temple for six years. As a child, he had likely become very familiar with the, the many parts of it. Joash told them to make repairs when a need was discovered, most likely knowing there were repairs that were already needed. The Hebrew word translated as repair is hakzah, which is often translated as strong or strengthened. But it's the same word used in Joshua 1 6 when God told Joshua to be strong, to be courageous. We're not given any detail here, but he speaks of, of three different sources of money. My Bible study describes them this way A, the money for which each man is assessed. Uh, described in Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16, each man was to given a half shekel at the age of 20 and was required to register for military service. This payment represented a ransom payment to the Lord. The man was to be given, uh, given to the Lord in his life, not in his death. Jesus would later give his life as a ransom for ours, for many. B, the money from assessment of persons, described in Leviticus 27. Various types of vows uh, might have a monetary assessment applied to them. The idea is that you may dedicate a variety of things to the Lord, servants, animals, houses, or land, but a certain amount of money could be given instead of them actually, uh, instead of the actual item. You may choose to give a servant to work in the temple of, gra uh, of gratitude for answered prayers, for example, but since only Levites were allowed to work in the temple, you can make a specified financial contribution instead. And, and thirdly, the letter C, the money that a man's heart prompts him to bring to the house of the Lord. Described in Leviticus chapter 22, verses 18 through 23, these are voluntary free will offerings. It could represent any amount. <clears throat> Continuing on in verse six, it says, but by the 23rd year of King Joash, the priest had made no repairs in the house. We're not given specific information as to when the order for repairs was given or how much time had gone by, but enough time had gone by for repairs to have been made, and none were. Joash was now 30 years old. Some believe this is due to the lack of prioritization or procrastination or a lack of funds being given. But here's the main point. There are resources available for repairs to the temple. They've been given for that purpose. But over some period of time, whatever money ha has been given hasn't been used for that purpose. We don't know how much was given, but there, but there should be some evidence of some repair made. The visible damage reflected poorly on the nation's relationship with God. Continue on in uh, verses 7 and 8, it says, Therefore, King Joash summoned Jedediah, the priest, and the other priests, and said to them, Why are you not repairing the house? Now, therefore, take no more money from your donors, but handed over for the repairs to the house. So the priests agree that they should take no money from the people and that they should not, re and, and that they should repair the house, excuse me, and that they should not repair the house. There was no charge made against the priest in regard to the finances. We don't know how much came in, whether much or little, but there is no discussion of improprietary, imp dishonesty, sorry. The only failure of the of the work was to be made. There is certainly a feeling of negligence or un, unfaithfulness. There is no answer provided as to why no repairs have been made. In any event, Joash makes a new arrangement, taking both the funds and the work to be done out of the hands of the priest. One commentary says, this would this would this would make it seem like there was was no concern that the priest had been embezzling funds. If Joash had that suspicion against the priest, he wouldn't have asked for their agreement to the to the new plan. He would have sought punishment, and he would have put it, uh, a tighter set of controls over the new process. Leaders 
are accountable for their actions. When leaders do not give task uh, their proper priority, others may assume the task are not important. Verse 9, it says, then Joash, I'm sorry, then Jedediah, the priest, took the chest and bore a hole in the lid, and the lid of it, and he set it before, beside the altar on the right side, as one enters the house of the Lord, and the priest who guarded the threshold, but it put in all the money that was brought to the house of the Lord. The parallel account in Second Chronicles chapter 24, verse 8, so, tells us that Jedediah made the chest at the king's command. The Hebrew word translated here, chest, is Arpon, Aron. Uh, it is the same word translated as ark in Exodus chapter 25, where God tells Moses to make an ark, the ark of the covenant. It is assumed that the chest was fairly large in order to be prominent. Hold that thought uh, that he bore a hole in the lid. Barnes notes on the Bible says this, the north door into the priest's court seems to be intended not the door of the temple building. The idea here is that the public chest would be set in an important place in the temple, near the great altar. The chest must have been placed a little to the right of this north door between it and the altar of burnt offerings so that the people could see it from the doorway. The people were not ordinarily allowed to go in within the doorway uh, into the, excuse me, the people were not ordinarily allowed to go within the doorway into the courtyard, which belonged to the priest and the Levites only. The people would bring their contribution and give it to the priest who would deposit them into the chest in sight of the people. Matthew Henry says this, when public distributions are made uh, faithfully, public contributions will be made cheerfully. The idea is, is that now we will all be encouraged as we see each other give. Question, why would it be important for it to be on the right side of the door? Barnes tells us that it would be more visible as above. In addition to that, the right side is generally a place of special honor in the Bible over the left. Many churches have prominently displayed donation boxes today in this same type of manner. Uh, the picture is my understanding where the X is. X marks the spot, right? Uh, is is my understanding of where this chest would have been. Continuing in verse 10, it says, Whenever they saw that there was much money in the chest, the king's secretary and the high priest came up, and they bagged and counted the money as it was found in the house of the Lord. The Hebrew word translated as secretary is most often translated as scribes, and it means to count. This was a high-level record-keeping individual. The task of collecting and counting money was now in the hands of the royal accounting secretary to perform along with the high priest. Two high officials of the palace and priesthood guaranteed accountability. Second Chronicles 24, 11 states that they collected the money every day. Continuing on in verse 11 and 12, it says, Then they would give the money that, uh, that was weighed out into the hands of the workmen, and, and who had the oversight of the house of the Lord, and they paid it out to the carpenters and the builders who worked on the house of the Lord, and to the masons and the stone cutters as well, uh, as to buy timber and quarried stone for making repairs on the house of the Lord, and and for the outlay for the repair of the house. The money was given to the workmen who had oversight, that is, the managers of the workmen. King Joash, in effect, takes on the, over the repair project. Joash took action. He recognized the current plan wasn't working. He changed the plan, putting people, procedures, and equipment in place in a way that would energize the efforts. Uh, verses 11, uh, I'm sorry, 13 and 14. But there was not enough, but excuse me, but, but, but there were not, uh, but there were not made for the house of the Lord basins of silver, stuffers, snuffers, bowls, trumpets, or any vessels of gold or of silver from the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. For it was given to the workmen who were repairing the house of the Lord with it. This reinforces the statement in verses 11 and 12 that the money was given to those who oversee the work on the buildings, not on the furnishings of the building. Joash wanted the people to see the results of their contributions in a tangible way. A new silver bowl just, it just wouldn't have the same impact. Continuing on in verse 15, 
and they did not ask for an accounting from the men in whose hand they delivered the money to pay the workmen, for, for they dealt honestly. Both, both the high priest and the palace knew how much money went into the project and accounted for the collection, but no accounting was needed or required from the supervisors of the work. The professional counters required no accounting. A believer's integrity in business can further God's kingdom than here, uh, here on earth. The words of Jesus, one who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If you then have not been faithful in the unrighteous, excuse me. If you then have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in, in what one another, if you see, and if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Luke chapter 16, verses 10 through 13. Verse 16 says, the money from the guilt offerings and the money from the sin offerings was not brought into the house of the Lord. It belonged to the priest. The guilt and sin offerings were mandatory when someone unintentionally sinned and, and, are, and are described in Leviticus chapters 4 through 7. The difference between the guilt offering and the sin offering is that the guilt offering is required where restitution for the sin can be made. In the case of theft, for example, a value for what was stolen could be determined and restitution had to be made, plus an additional 20%. A sin offering was required in cases where no restitution was possible. If a person lied, for example, it may not be possible to assign value to a lie for restitution purposes. Pulpit commentary says this, the priest rarely received any money from either of these offerings. But it was customary to give a voluntary gift to the priest who completed the sacrifice. Joash did not interfere with the money that was that rightfully belonged to the priest. There are many things that we can apply to our lives from this passage. Joash did what was right in the eyes of God while he was being influenced by Jedodiah. Later in his life, after Jedodiah died, Joash did evil. The impact of positive influences on a person's life is huge. And we all know that. So here's a question. What is it influencing your spiritual growth today? And as a believer, who are you influencing? Second, leaders are accountable for their actions, and God expects his people to take care of their obligations. It's easy to forget that everyday actions like being aware of the conditions around us and solving important problems are important to God. God wants us to demonstrate accountability, and even more so to the things of God. We saw the priest didn't make any progress uh, to the repairs of the temple for whatever reason. We saw Joash make a change in the arrangement to solve the problem and at the same time model God's values in placing the temple as a high priority. Third, the workers who had oversight of the temple repairs were so honest that no accounting was required of them. They were people of absolute integrity. Can you imagine how honest a person would have to be uh, for, for, for your accounting office to require no accounting uh, from a vendor. That's quite a standard, and we should strive to be that way. Fourthly, and finally, I want to take a look back at the temple and the chest uh, in, in closing. There is a great imagery in the story that we should take note of. The temple in our story is a building over 125 years old and is in need of repairs. Just before he died, Jesus said, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, uh, would I have told you to, to uh, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself. And where I am, you may also be John chapter 14, verses two and three. The temple complex was a large place made up of multiple areas. The word translated temple here doesn't speak to the entire temple complex, but specifically refers to the temple building itself, which is made, uh, which which was made up of the holy place and the most holy place. 
what was in the most holy place? It was designed to house the Ark of the Covenant and symbolize the presence of God. At the same time that Jesus uh, went to prepare a place for us in heaven, he prepared a place for we, uh, he prepared a place for us in, in, in our hearts. He made the bodies of believers a temple for the Holy Spirit to live in. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. What does it mean exactly? Uh, the Holy Spirit being in us, it identifies us. He identifies with us and influences us. He transforms us. The Holy Spirit inside of us makes us holy, sacred, and pure. The Holy Spirit is a deposit, a seal that guarantees our place with Jesus in heaven forever. We already discussed, discussed the word translated as chest. It is the same word translated as ark that God told Moses to build, which became known as the Ark of the Covenant. I find a number of similarities between the chest and the ark. So what did the ark represent? It represented the presence of God. What did the ark have in it? It had three things in it, a jar of manna that God provided in the wilderness, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablet of the law. All three of these reflect God's provision and authority and point to Jesus, the Savior who was to come. The manna represents Jesus as the bread of life, which we are to partake of, to access every day. The rod of Aaron that budded represents the eternal priestly authority of Jesus. The tablets represented the law of God from the lawgiver himself and the one who fulfilled the law. Those things are meant to serve as a reminder of the provision of God and impact the way that we live our lives. The lid on the chest in our lesson today had a hole bore into it. The lid to the ark was called the atonement cover, and it was also known as the mercy seat. The mercy seat was where God would dwell. God told Moses that he would meet with him uh, there at the mercy seat, according to Exodus chapter 25, verse 22. The ultimate mercy would come from Jesus, who was able to forgive all sins. By boring a hole in the lid of the chest, we might say that the lid was pierced. Said another way, the presence of God was pierced. Isaiah 53, 5, speaking of Jesus saying, he was pierced for our transgressions. I believe the chest in our story today symbolizes the Ark of the Covenant, which symbolizes Jesus. The Ark represents the presence of God in the temple. And now the temple of the Holy Spirit is inside of the believer. What's the condition of your temple? The temple of our story is in need of repair. Or, or, or as we saw, the word translated as repair is more commonly translated as strong or strengthened. The temple of the Holy Spirit inside of you needs no repair. It's perfect. But how, how, how is your access to the power that resides in there? Does your access need, to, need some strengthening? Does your, does your reliance on God, your relationship with God, need some strengthening too? On one hand, there is nothing that we can do to strengthen the temple that is residing in the place of the Holy Spirit in our heart because it's perfect. On the other hand, the temple can be suffering a little due to neglect on our part. How frequently do you meet with God there? The priests in our story today were unable to make repairs to the temple. The same is true with regard to your, uh, with, with the use of your, your, of the temple inside of you. Said another way, your spiritual life and eternal destination is up to you. The priest in our story today didn't make the repairs to it. And your priest or pastor can't make repairs or strengthen of that which is inside of you. They, may, they can encourage you and provide all kinds of valuable spiritual insights and share with you the promises of God. But overall, the degree to which you meet with God and do his will is up to you. It doesn't matter who your pastor is or who your grandmother was. Uh, if your grandmother was a Bible-believing saint that sang in the choir, she can't strengthen your spiritual life either. Only you, operating in the power of the Holy Spirit, can strengthen your spiritual life. Question. How can we do that? In our story day, there are three sources of money to be put in to the fund for repairs. A contribution for the coming change to register for military service. An assessment for property that you owe is dedicated to the Lord. 
And then there's a voluntary free will offering. Do you know that when you became a Christian, you registered for military service? The Christian life is a spiritual battle, not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Are you making a contribution, so to speak, by reporting for battle every day? By the world standard, more than likely, you are considered wealthy with respect to the things that you own and the standard of living that you have. Are the things you, you own dedicated to the Lord? Are they available to God? If the Lord said to you, I want to give you blank, I want you to give blank to a certain person, would you do it with joy? Is that your first response? Well, it depends on what it is. Or would your response, or, or is your response that if I told if God told you to give someone you owe to someone something to someone else, it can only be to further the kingdom, and there must be a really good reason for it, and that it will glorify him. In terms of voluntary offering, free will offerings, how's your dedication and your commitment to God? What's the most valuable thing that you have? Yourself? If you're a believer in Jesus. Maybe the most valuable thing that you have is your time. Are you making a regular contribution of your time with God to live in accordance to his will and further his kingdom? Are you seeking to further his kingdom by serving him in a tangible way? Are you living a selfless, selfless lifestyle that honors our Heavenly Father? Our relationship with God can be improved by checking in with God every day or to prepare for, for the spiritual battle that will be present today. Willingly to dedicate anything we owe to the cause and willing to give our time and ourselves to prepare for God's will for the day. In all of these things, we should be like the workmen who dealt honestly, who dealt honestly with what we have been given. Question, have you given yourself to God have you received the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ? If not, we would like for you. We, we would like to know more. Feel free to reach out to us at the link below. We'd love to talk to you about it and how you can have this peace and be a temple of the Holy Spirit. Reach out to us at houstonsfirst.org forward slash the dash loop forward slash about forward slash discover hyphen or dash Christ. God bless, and we pray this uh, lesson uh, furthers the kingdom.